Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I'm going to part the veil of reality for a moment. And here we are in a hyperspace tube shooting through the galaxy. Suddenly we drop out of it. The star field snaps into view. A beautiful planet stretches before us and we pan down, down to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. That's right, it's Star Wars. And today we are meeting with Max Brook who is one of the designers over at Fantasy, Fantasy Flight Games, right? I always, for some yes. reason, want to say uh, Final Fantasy Games, but that's a different company, isn't it? A little different, yeah. So for those of you who don't know, and I would imagine anyone who's listening to this right now does know, but the, uh, the Star Wars RPG system is the exciting narrative dice role-playing game that Fantasy Flight Games came out with it was like about 2012 or so was that your first book or, or is my date wrong on that it would be later than um that, 2012 it? i believe was the first one yes because i started the company at 2000 in 2011 and it came out okay. shortly thereafter great so it, uh i love this system so much it's it's probably i've been playing i mean i've been playing D D since i was a chubby little middle schooler uh but of all the different role-playing game systems i've ever played this probably has my favorite dice mechanic in it, and it's also set in the Star Wars universe, which is everybody's favorite universe. Um, and if you've never played it, it has cinematic action, intense combat, pulse-pounding drama, all worthy of the original Star Wars movies, uh, and that's what makes this role-playing game really, really amazing. So I personally feel pretty delighted that we can actually talk with somebody who has putting, is putting out these books. I mean, uh, you can see some of these books behind me. I think Forged in Battle, you were the lead uh, lead designer on. Is that correct? Yeah, I was I was a uh, lead on Forged in Battle, and I was the um, uh, so for well, I can get into the details later. Um, I was also the uh, lead on uh, the Age Rebellion beginner game behind you, as it happens. So. Oh wow, on the beginner game as well. Okay, that's good. Well, yes. let's let's start there. So, uh, you know, I don't even know what your official title is at uh, at Fantasy Flight. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started and what you're doing there now? Yeah, definitely. So, um, so at Fantasy Flight Games, I'm a uh, role-playing game producer. Um, although I'm also a uh, miniatures games developer, I worked on X-wing as well and Armada a little bit. So I'm actually I've got my finger in a, a couple of pies. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but in my capacity on role-playing games, which is what we're here to discuss, um, I'm a uh, role-playing games producer. So. Um, uh, but you'll notice if you look at the credits, um, it, it says uh, lead developer, and that's because the producer-developer role is different for some projects and the same for others. So for role-playing games, it's just one person who does all of that. So I am sort of like the project manager for those, okay. um, but then I also do a lot of the internal design and development content. Um, whereas on something that has more... Um, uh, more demanding producer work, and basically anything that you know involves plastic or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else is there to uh, do uh, a lot of the producer stuff because it's more than one person can do, and also do all the development. So when I'm working on an X-wing project, I have a a producer um, who's there to uh, you know make sure we make the ships and such. But since the only plastic in the role playing game is the dice, and those are all done, <laughs> it's much more manageable. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I actually am really intrigued by the X-Wing and Armada games as well. Uh, I think you guys actually on your website put out a really interesting article which addressed something I've been toying with for a while, which is how do you merge the role-playing game with the, the miniatures games? Because it, like, just the idea of, like, playing at the table with your friends and being like, uh-oh, TIE Fighters inbound, and then you just jump into a miniature combat seems really really cool to me and really desirable uh but I yeah talk, no, no, talk on that <laughs> if you have to. definitely um so uh yeah that was i think that was um brian young who's written a series of guest articles for us um yeah. uh, who uh who wrote that and that was a really good one it was an article we've been um sort of like mulling over internally and then you know one day i think i, I don't know how it happened exactly i've stuck with marketing but that article goes up on the site and we all go oh, it's a great idea i'm glad he did that we'd all been sort of like thinking like oh we, maybe we should do it talk to marketing about that and then it happened with no uh, i was gonna say it it, ha it happened perfectly in this you know yeah absolutely. we didn't have to do anything so it was great um it, but it, uh it's such an appealing... Well, I mean, that just, I think, speaks to how awesome the Star Wars universe is. What an awesome license to have be your playground right now. You know, that you can 
think about doing things like that. That's that's so amazing to me. Um, yeah, definitely. So that that article um, still up on our website, obviously, uh, is a, is a good read. Definitely check that out um, for some ideas. Um, I have some uh, ideas of my own because I've actually I've done that for Star Wars role playing games when I was oh, running an really? Age of Rebellion. Game. Um, I specifically tied it in with uh, Armada, um, and mm. so uh, this works with, for X Wing or Armada, but but it's the way I I would tie the two in. I have tied the two in, and I thought it worked really well. Um, so what, what I did was, instead of tying in directly and having the player characters jump into X-Wings on the table, which you could definitely do and could be a lot of fun, um, I actually had it as a battle that was going on at the same time as some of the stuff um, that was uh, going on oh, in their session. That's really clever. I have not thought of that. So there, you so, have people on the ground... Uh, rolling the dice, the narrative dice, and doing that system, but then at the same time, then or I guess not simultaneously, but then you jump over to the space battle. Yeah, table. exactly. So actually, um, so the, w the way we had it going on was um, I uh, I was lucky enough to um, have a a uh, a friend around who had been looking to play Armada. So basically, we had to, we had to have this big space battle, and then the PCs were also running a a mission that was going on around that space battle, and their mission sort of had a longer term goal, so it didn't really tie in with that. But it was this nice like it it tied in with them. Um, so what so I had one of the PCs who was a commander play in the game of Armada while everyone else was doing their stuff, mm -hmm. and then the results of the battle sort of played out into the session. So like oh some ship went down and that became relevant in the game, or and it was nice because it meant that. You know, I didn't have to worry about this competitive game, like killing off a bunch of PCs because they got blown up or something. Because yeah. X Wing is is, I mean, you can always bail out and such, but X Wing is far more lethal than uh, casual combat mm -hmm. in uh, in the role playing game. I mean, especially if you're in a in a bigger ship. But even if you're in a starfighter, you're going to survive a few more hits um, generally. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there's sort of means for player characters to survive that uh, that X poor X wing pilots don't have. <laughs> no, no, you're you're pretty much screwed in in X wing. And I have actually not played a game of Armada, but uh, from what I've looked at online, like I've followed some of the games online, especially when you're doing that really cool uh, kind of showdown battles. I don't know what the terminology was, but you had fans submit their um, fleets, and then yes. you actually had them play off against each other. And I was following that on your website as well, and I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah, I actually I played one of those fleets. Um, oh, I yeah. was uh, I uh, I uh, was uh, defeated by Sam Stewart, who couldn't make it tonight in the uh, in the finals. Um, uh, yeah, so that was that was great because we had we had um, uh, that was a it was a fun event. Um, yeah. But yeah, so you can do a lot of a lot of neat narrative stuff already with Armada and with X Wing, obviously. Um, and uh, so Ooh. tying that into a a, yeah. a role-playing campaign is pretty easy, but I like setting it on a sort of separate axis so that it's like, I don't have to worry about killing off PCs in the X-Wing game, mm -hmm. but the X-Wing game provides some, you know, fleshes out the story, and maybe the, or Armada's particularly good for this, you know, fleshes out the story, gives some events that are going on around them, it affects them, so, like, they care if the, you know, person who's yeah. playing for their side wins, but it's not, um... It's not necessarily like under their direct control. Okay. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I, I really like the idea of like, mm -hmm, like even if the PCs could even be like people on one of those ships, maybe they're not the captain, but they're having their own interaction or something like that. And then, uh oh, your ship is getting shot down in the Armada level game or something like that. And then obviously then you get the interaction between the two axes, which is, I think that's a really clever approach. Um, it, it's also neat because it lets you have cameos of famous Star Wars people without having to have them, you know, overshadow your players or what have you. Mm -hmm. So you can have, like, oh, Darth Vader was in that battle and he shot down this ship. Like, we never saw him because he was, you know, five kilometers away. But, but he was there and he did something cool and it affected us, you know. Yeah, that is pretty awesome. The, the only, um, what the stumbling block I've been hitting is a DM uh, running. So I run a, a bi-weekly game out here on a the web stream that we do called Never Tell Me the Odds on Twitch. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a DM, and I come from a very DM background, which is like, I want to keep all four of my players at the table engaged at the same time and interacting with each other. And so that's the stumbling block I've kind of hit as trying to get into like Armada, because Armada is fundamentally two players, right? You've got like I, two sides. 
It is, although, I mean, I will say it wouldn't be that difficult to, for Armada or for X-Wing, to set up an asymmetrical game. Um, mm -hmm. So you could you could pretty easily, I mean, if you wanted to do, um, you know, Armada, you could play a 400-point Imperial fleet against, you know, like four little 100-point, you know, splinter fleets um, yeah. uh, of rebels, maybe one under the command of each of the PCs or something. Um, oh yeah, that's so a you good could idea. Do, you could do something like that that would work pretty well. But I also think um, part of the reason it worked so well in the game I ran it was because I wasn't actually playing in the Armada game directly. Mm -hmm. I I had someone else playing the Imperial side, and one of the players played the Rebel side, and then I was just able to sort of like poke my head over there every now and then, and be like, okay, this this is happening, that's happening. Oh, but I, I wasn't see. actually playing directly in that game, and they were basically just playing a normal game, except that for one of them it had some role playing repercussions too. I think, um, I think that's great. Yeah, that gives me all sorts of, of devilish DMing ideas. Like, you could even have uh, the players could have one goal, but maybe that goal could be slightly at odds with the goal of the rebellion at large. And sure. so it's like, do we win this space battle? And especially if you have the players playing, say, their characters in the RPG version, and then they're playing kind of fleet commander scale off the fleet, and then they kind of would have to make decisions between. Uh, we sacrifice the ship, and then those characters die, but then we win this battle. Hmm. Hmm. As yeah. You guess, hmm. There's little devil's bargains that you can make. Players Another do. good one you could do that that springs to mind is you could you could always um, use it as a way to give them a like, if, especially X one would be good for this. I think to give them a a like a snapshot of another place, sort of like the old trick of like, okay, you know, it's the beginning of a session. And we're going to cold open where you're all playing town guards and then you all get killed by the monster. So that when your PCs <laughs> roll into town, you know, you sort of know what to expect, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, so you could basically do the the equivalent of that. Where, like, we're going to play a game of X-Wing where you each have one ship and I have a, you know, uh, yeah. you know, maybe you each have an X-Wing and I have a, a Decimator or something. And, like, we play this game and then, you know, like... If you if, if if you guys win the game, you know, like maybe one of those pilots makes it back and reports and tells you about this, and if they don't mm -hmm. win this game, none of them make it back, and then you have to go find out what happened to them or something. Oh, I love that idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. So then you can you can sort of have these again. It, it puts it on this other axis, and it can be like an opportunity for this sort of you know emergent storytelling moment where you're like, all right, I don't know if you guys are going to win or I'm going to win. We're going to play a game of a relatively normal game of, of X-Wing, but then like we'll seed that into the story and that'll become part of the like arc of our role playing characters. Yeah. I like that. And then that really spice that adds a whole level of, of spice to the uh, X-Wing or the Armada level game as well. Right. Cause then it's like, um, you can kind of come up with more, uh, of the, uh, motivations or objectives on the X-Wing level, you know, where all of a sudden it's like, I need to get one X-Wing off the opposite side of the map in order to get word to the Rebellion, and the stakes are that my characters will suffer if that doesn't happen. All of a sudden, that X-Wing game feels like a lot more, or that Armada game feels like a lot more uh, Yeah, compelling. definitely. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of... Actually, one thing um, for, for X-Wing stuff that's good for inspiration for that is I'd, I'd take a look at the missions that come in a lot of the... Uh, especially the large ships. And there'll be these sort of like special scenarios where like... Oh, I'm trying to, you know, like, I'm trying to sabotage something or steal intel or, you know, doing this these various tasks. And they're already a little bit, they have a little bit of a role-playing game feel to them already because they've got these sort of secondary goals as opposed to just being a head-to-head -head dogfight. Yeah. So, like, taking a look at some of those, and you could probably very easily, like, reskin one of those to be a good, like, um, a good, you know, role-playing side mission. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, just drop that right into an Age of Rebellion game as, as whatever the characters are about. I love yeah. It. That's very cool. Okay, I love that. Those are amazing ideas, and that, that answers... I'm really glad. I didn't know that you had that X-Wing background, but that is lovely, lovely stuff. Yeah, and then, of course, another, another good option, too, is to... Um, which is the one I, I've done most often, is just to use X-Wing figures for space battles because, you know, they're really <laughs> nice minis, and if I have some of them, you know, I'm going to find an excuse to put those into any campaign I'm playing in, so... Yeah, they are gorgeous miniatures. Uh, again, I bet a lot of the people who are, who are listening to this have seen them, but if you haven't, absolutely check out those X-Wing and Armada miniatures, even if you don't get into the game side of it. The miniatures themselves are great, and the X-Wing... Uh, I Definitely on the X-Wing scale, they're perfect for... Drop it on your tabletop, even if you're not going to use the dials, uh, dial-based combat or whatever. It's they're awesome. They come pre-painted, but the the level of detail I'm always blown away by. 
you know, like you'll see like the rust on the inside of the vents and everything like that. That's really great. Our uh, our production department works really hard on those, and they do a they do a great job. They uh, yeah, they work really hard. They they have yeah. a great attention to detail, and they they work with you know they work with the factories and Lucasfilm and all these people, and they just do a fantastic job on it. That's great. Yeah, and uh, I I said that a little bit at the top, but I think the fact that a uh, fantasy flight has this license just makes me so happy because the quality of work you guys put out on all of your properties is amazing. Um, you guys are just you guys are dedicated to doing it right, which is really nice. Especially since the Star Wars properties kind of bounced around a little bit over the last, you know, since the 70s. So it's, it's cool to see it with you guys now. That's really awesome. Funny um, uh, point of, uh, point of, of, I mean, I guess it makes sense, but uh, one funny thing about integrating X-Wing and uh, the role-playing game is they're both designed by Jay Little. Um oh. Who, uh, if you haven't had a chance to him, he uh, to talk to him. He's a uh, really neat guy um, and a great mm-hmm. designer. But um, he he actually designed uh, both of them. So okay, so he still works with you guys at uh, FFG. Um, he's uh, freelance these days. Freelance. Um, but he does uh, does stuff with us and he keeps in contact. And he's just just a great guy all around. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll reach out to him. That's really cool. I'd love to. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Um, and he was the designer behind uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition, which uh, a lot of ideas from that uh, became were refined and became Edge of the Empire. So That is really cool. Uh, so, how did you... Uh, just to give people a little more context about your background, uh, you said you started working at FFG. You've been there since uh, 2011, did you say? Yeah, so I, I started, uh, I was hired on to work on our um, Warhammer 40k role-playing games, um, and I worked on uh, Rogue Trader a whole bunch. Um, cool. Uh, and then, um, you know, I've, uh, I've worked on a bunch of the Star Wars games in, in the interim, so I've done a bunch of stuff on Edge of the Empire, Age of Rebellion, Force and Destiny. Yeah. Um, and it was funny, because I got there right around the time... That, that we were we hadn't we hadn't announced the Star Wars license yet and we were just sort of spinning up you know spinning mm. up working on all the stuff so I was I was able to see uh, Edge of the Empire not from not from the very beginning um, Jay had already designed it but it hadn't been like completely solidified yet so I got to play in some of the early playtests not the first ones but the like sort of second batch and such so it's been really amazing to see it grow wow. from that to like what it is now the yeah, uh, the the three headed uh, the three headed monster it is now in all yeah. its impressive glory. Yeah, it's gorgeous right now. Uh, so you say three headed. So I assume you're referring to we've got Edge of the Empire, Age of Rebellion, and then Force and Destiny. As Correct. These, these three heads going on. Yeah. So again, so this is uh, if there's anything that does slightly annoy me about the game, it's that when I'm trying to tell people about it, I never quite know what to refer to it as. Because uh, I think a lot of times people just call it Edge of the Empire, because that was the first core book that came out. Uh, and then that was followed up by the two other source books, or the two other main core books, Age of Rebellion, Force and Destiny, which are all part of the same game system. There's a little bit of variance between uh, some mechanics on the edges. Namely, it's uh, the obligation, duty, and morality systems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but they're, they're all totally worked together. And so I kind of call it Star Wars RPG by default. Um, is there in house? Is there a way you guys refer to the overall umbrella of the system, or do you usually just refer to it by each of the core books? Um, well, we generally refer to it as, as Star Wars role playing. Um, Star Wars role playing. Uh, though obviously that can create some confusion when I'm talking to somebody who who doesn't, you know, know I work for FFG or whatnot, because then it's like, well, no, not this edition, and no, not this other edition, no, the, yeah. the, the, the FFG one, you know. Yeah, so um, that, yeah, that usually have to be like, oh, the Star Wars RPG by FFG. Yeah, so the Fantasy Flight Star Wars role playing, or the Star Wars role playing game, or you know, Star Wars okay. RPG. I mean, in, in common parlance, any of those I, are what I tend to use. Um, okay. The uh, the narrative dice system is, of course, the the system, although it, um, uh, you know, is uh, not so formalized, but it's, um, but yeah, so the. Yeah. You mentioned that at the beginning. The, the narrative dice are sort of one of the things that, that stand out about it, but obviously that's not a... It doesn't tell you, you know, that it's Star Wars. So yeah, Star Wars role yeah. play. <laughs> okay, so you don't have a, a better solution than I have. That's that's fine. That is the one thing where I find it hard uh, to... 
uh, encapsulate everything that it is, because it is, like you said, these kind of three heads, and they are all kind of unique. Um, the narrative dice system is amazing, though. I would like to talk to it, or basically just gush about it. I love it. It's, uh, you know, like I said, cut my teeth on the old D20 D&D system, which is still great, and I love it, but I love the combination of you get the dice, and you have your dice pool, and that's very concrete. I know exactly what I'm rolling, and that's not up to interpretation. Uh, and then when I roll it, there's an actual, there's a definite pass-fail mechanic in success and failure, so I know if I succeed or fail, but then you're given so much leeway and interpretation at the table between that advantage and the threat system. Uh, I, personally, in running podcasts and streams, it's ideal for doing these like um, kind of live play or even, you know, uh, yeah, basically live play podcasts and stuff because it, it keeps it interesting, but it also keeps it grounded, which is not something I found any other system does to that degree. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, what yeah, I mean? It- it definitely leads to those cinematic moments you're talking about, um, you know, that I would imagine make it really good for a live streaming. I, I never have, but I, I imagine that would be good for that, yeah. Um, it's delightful. And those, yeah, no, it, those those unexpected, you know, like, okay, failure, triumph, despair, three threat. <laughs> so, you know, like, you're on fire now, yes. um, but you managed to put out the... Yeah, or you're on fire now, and you know uh, mm-hmm. you uh, you managed to tell you know engineering that the that the engines are on fire, and uh, also <laughs> you know like, bursts out of the hold and a wampa mul- bursts out of the hold. Yeah, exactly. The door the door mul- breaks down, and that wampa you're transporting gets loose. Yeah, um, you're you're drowning, yeah, exactly. but it's in a back to, uh, back to tank, so you're yeah yeah. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. I love yeah, it. exactly. Um, um, no, I, it's. Some of my favorite oh, moments are, uh, uh, I think, it, and it speaks to how successful this system is, is that people will roll, like we'll be playing at the table, and a roll will come down, and first of all, everyone will sometimes, if it's at this high-pitched moment, everyone will leap out of their seats to see what the dice roll is, what came down, and then if it's a despair or something like that, uh, a lot of times the players will just suggest what the horrible thing is, because it, it engages them on that narrative level that's so satisfied. So I'll be oh, yeah. the DM, and I'll be like, oh, despair! Um, and then a player will be like, oh, maybe all of the escape pods jettison into outer space. And I'm like, great, that definitely happens. I, that's way worse than I was going to do to you. So Yeah, I think uh, hooking the players in on, on that is, is one, of, one of my favorite GM tricks in the system overall, because they will absolutely come up with much worse stuff for themselves than I would have thought of. Mm-hmm. And, and I think one of the things that really works about the system is it, it really helps feel... Uh, it, the way the the way the dice work out, and the way you know, the way you you get these emergent moments, mm-hmm. and just some other things about the system. I think the like general level of character competence and lethality and such work out nicely. That I feel like people are really more than in some other systems. They tend to be okay with like mm-hmm. you know setting themselves up for something really bad to happen, and that's always an interesting problem. Creating incentives for bad things to happen to your character, and you can you can yeah. mechanize it, and that can work really well. Um, systems like uh, you know fate do that really well, obviously, and um, I mean even the the obligation system sort of gives you incentive to screw yourself over in, in Edge of the Empire. Yeah, um, yeah there's, uh, there's a couple systems that that try and get at that, and they usually have this kind of like additional set of rules which comes on to it. You know what I mean? Uh, Seventh C just finished launching uh, their second edition, which I was a big fan of that, and they've got some great like ways to encourage people to fail. Uh, but it's all this additional stuff, and I love how it's built into the dice, essentially, in this system, where um, it's in the act of interpreting what's going on. People are coming up with it. So yeah, it's really it, cool. It, it, really, it really incites that creative storytelling. And I think I think the, the Star Wars aspect of it is, is, is relevant here, too, and that, mm-hmm. like... It sort of sets the tone, so everybody sort of has some idea of what can and should happen. It's like, yeah, I, one of one of the tricky things with role playing games is you know like, you have to make sure that the players and the GM and everybody is on the same page. And one of the great things about Star Wars is that I can I can run it for anybody, and I'll have an I'll mm-hmm. have an idea that of where they are roughly, probably, or I'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly. I mean, I, I've run the Age Rebellion beginner game for my parents, and, <laughs> you know, if I was if I was running, you know... Um, Fate for them or something. Fate or D&D or something else for them, you know, it wouldn't be just 
they wouldn't just like snap to understanding what happens, what should happen as quickly as with Star Wars, because it's just such a, you know, it's got such a cultural presence. And it's like, yeah. you know, they've seen all the movies, they've seen, you know, they've seen Force Awakens, you know, they, they haven't like delved as deep into the EU sinkhole as I have, <laughs> but you know, like they, they certainly, um, you know, like, but they but they know it and they know what it is and they understand yeah. what feels right for Star Wars and so you know yeah. the fact that everyone's I, on the same page because they're all aware of what the tone is that is huge. Where like you're right in something like D and D, one of the challenges of being a DM right and being at a table in any game is that we're the game doesn't live in any one person. It's this shared space that we're all kind of creating together. And to get there, people have to harmonize on the tone. And that can be challenging because everyone has their own idea. But you're right, with the Star Wars movies, people are like, oh, good, okay, it's going to be like, uh, I know exactly what the droids act like. I know exactly uh, what the Empire does, and everyone is on that page. Yeah, it definitely it definitely helps a lot in, in keeping people in the same thematic space. And I think, uh, you know, the, the core mechanics tap into this well as well. And that's sort of, I think that's part of the reason that it doesn't as much need additional subsystems, where, like, you know... It doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, the, the the core rule book. It might it might suggest it as an option that like players can suggest things for threat. But really, I've just seen it as a thing that emerges at every table. It's like, yeah. you know, er, you know, it, it's just sort of a thing that it's happens. Natural. People will suge will, su will suggest like you know narrative threat options for the GM, and um, <laughs> and I think it's because people feel comfortable putting their characters at risk in Star Wars in a way that they might not in other games sometimes because yeah. there's sort of an expectation of like. Oh, you're gonna get shot at by some stormtroopers, and then you're gonna jump into a, you know, a trash compactor, and then you're gonna get attacked <laughs> by a monster, and then you're gonna get out of the trash compactor, and yeah. you know, just narrowly survive, and then like, you know, and, and player characters die, and there are bad things that happen, but there's sort of this like hmm. pulp adventure feel to it that you know, like, can be in any yeah. number of things, and if everyone gets it, you'll get the same sort of thing. But Star Wars just sort of sets everybody there, I think, I, at I least more than many games. I would agree, and I, I think that also speaks to the fact that it, uh, or this is my personal philosophizing, but that goes back to uh, the fact that it's a movie, and that the way movies are structured are, like you said, they're supposed to be big and exciting adventure stories. Um, and so I find that I kind of started doing it unconsciously, and now, as I've thought about it, I've done it more, but I just do screen wipes in the game, and things like that to get people to the mm -hmm. next scene. So I'm like, okay, you guys are heading to that planet, screen wipe, too. And, you know, these cuts, and I kind of crib some of these movie moments that, mm -hmm. one, people respond to, and two, make the game feel great. And I think that contrasts to a system like D&D, &D, where I think when people come to D&D, &D, you're thinking, like, books, Lord of the Rings, and all these fantasy books that we grow up on. And so there's more of this feeling to want to have these big, epic, sprawling stories I mean, obviously, The Lord of the Rings uh, is a movie that you can cite for that, but I really think the high oct not high octane, but high adventure, pulp adventure that we get in the Star Wars movies really uh, does get everyone on the same page in terms of wanting to have these exciting, cool, fun adventures that move along quickly. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I mean, one of the things I love about D and D is that it has so much in its DNA in a direct sense you know it's not just Lord of the Rings it's but it's also you know like uh, Michael Moorcock you know his, his fantasy and his conceptions of the universe exactly. and um, you know uh, I mean you see like shades of like the Chronicles of Amber and like it's a real I mean, melange yeah absolutely Dune you know and like all these all these formative works and I'm sure dozens I don't know about too yeah. um, and so like it, it inspires some really amazing stories that way at the table, and I think that, that works to its advantage. And Star Wars has those things, too, but they're all sort of filtered through the lens of those films. Yes. Um, and there's a clear, like, filtering lens, whereas D&D is sort of its own filtering lens, which has various advantages and disadvantages. I would agree with um, that. And one I, of the things that, that I was worried about a little bit when I first started playing, because um, D&D is kind of like unbound imagination. Like, you go for it. Here are the... Here's a set of fantasy rules, but fantasy worlds, as you're, you're just citing half a dozen examples that'll have totally different takes. Um, with, so with Star Wars, I was a little afraid that I was like, okay, as a DM, how long can I run this before I start going, well, no, I've done that story, and these other stories don't fit into that model. But um, something that's really great about the Star Wars universe is that you have this huge galaxy, and it's been populated with so many planets. And just flipping to that page in the, the rule book or looking at the great poster of the galaxy 
that uh, was in the beginner game for Force Awakens, which I love. Um, just looking at that, you go, oh man, there's so many different wonderful adventures you can stick everywhere in this galaxy. So the more I've, I've come up with different adventure ideas, the more I've kind of come to realize Star Wars is this wonderful elastic universe that has room for all these amazing adventures. Um, oh, I could, I could talk, I could, or I could, I could praise the system for a long time because I love it so much. But I actually wanted to ask you a, little, a slightly more specific question about, um, and if you can't answer this, that's fine, but trying to run a game that's not strictly Age of Rebellion or Edge of the Empire or Force and Destiny, but when you have characters from all of those different ones intermingled, which is mm -hmm. kind of where I've, I've ended up now, where you'll have someone who's like, great, I want to be the scoundrel, and somebody else wants to be a commander, and somebody else, well, of course, everybody else wants to be Force users or Force sensitive. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... for, for Jedi, Han Solo, and, uh, <laughs> you know, like, uh, one person... Uh, uh, Princess Leia or something like and that. And Princess Leia walk into a bar, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely um, you get that. So, so it's, the, it's that morality, the obligation, and the duty mechanic. And for me, I've had a little trouble juggling, like, applying morality to everyone across the board and obligation, and duty has felt like too much, but then saying only this person is affected by morality and you guys aren't has felt a little piecemeal. I was wondering if you have a, a, had a take on that or if you had an approach that you, that you think works well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, my general approach is that I I do go the route of assigning uh, one to each PC. I mean, like, I, I, um, we have a section in um, each of the core rule books after Edge of the Empire about, like, how to handle the two together. But, like... At the end of the day, I, I actually think it works it works quite well to have them be um, separated out. Um, uh, it can also work pretty well to choose one of them that everybody has, and then other people may have another. So, mm -hmm. for instance, if you're playing a sort of scummy game, you know, but you want but several people want to be force sensitives as they invariably do, right. um, giving them a morality, but also everyone having an obligation can work pretty well too. Um, but I, I think generally it's best to focus on one per character. Um, though acquiring others in play is totally a valid thing that can happen. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So, so I think if you're going to do the best way to do it is to think about which one and talk to the player about this, obviously, but to think about which one is going to be most important to the character's story. You could do morality for a character who isn't force sensitive. If um, morality is important to their story, if their like moral status is, is mm -hmm. going to be, you know, like an important part of their story. Um, yeah. I think that's and a good I, point. I think you could actually do some really interesting stuff with that. But on the other hand, um, if somebody, wants to play a a Han Solo type, you know, mm -hmm. or, or Lando, Han Solo or Lando Calrissian type, you know, a bit of a, uh, you know, a, yeah. a, 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 a lovable scoundrel. Um, tracking morality may just not be worth it for them, you know, like, their, their morality is probably going to be more fixed than that of most Force users, and it's going to be sort of fixed at, like, oh, mm -hmm. well, he's not so bad. Okay, well, that thing was a little bad, but, like, he's not so bad, and he's really <laughs> nice. Everybody likes him, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's, it, I think, I think if, if it will add to the game, absolutely go ahead and, and, uh, you know, add one of these resources for a character. And I, I think, um, if there's one that's going to be sort of tone setting to the campaign, you can have everyone take that one and then just have other people take an additional one as needed. So for instance, if okay, one good... of the themes of the campaign is really your debts or your duty to the rebellion, I think it could be very easy to have everybody have those and then you know yeah yeah i tend to lean towards the the obligation i find is as just the most intriguing storytelling tool in that it's it's cool to have a, a quirk kind of that comes up maybe randomly in a session where it's like uh oh okay so now i'm gonna have to work in these you know hot mafiosos who are going to show up and put a little pressure on you and that's kind of this unexpected element um or his duty is a little more fixed. You can kind of know what that is in respect to how things go. But uh, and morality is, is gets even a little bit slightly random in terms of, of depending on your dice roll uh, at the end to determine your conflict points. Um, mm. So I find those I find those are, are also interesting and great. But as as a storytelling tool, I tend to like to make everyone take obligation and then pepper in usually morality or duty where it makes sense. Yeah, and that's a perfectly good route to go. Um, I, I definitely think that obligation is the 
is the easiest of the three to quickly it, it is the it is the easiest of the three to explain because all you have to say True. is Han Solo has an obligation to Jabba the Hutt and that drives his story. You know, like yeah. Han Han has lots of stuff going on, but at the end of the day, like a lot of his story choices are driven by the fact that he owes Jabba a, an obscene amount of money, right? Yeah. So and people you know, get that immediately. That's and people true. get that immediately. Uh, yeah. um, Duty is a little more challenging because it doesn't quite have the same obvious example from the movies. I think Duty... Um, I don't know anything about Rogue One that you don't, but uh, but mm -hmm. I do think that Duty in the context of Rogue One is going to be interesting. And I wonder if maybe we'll get some interesting new models for that since it looks like it's very much about, um, about people who believe in the cause. Um, I'm quite I'm quite interested in, in Rogue One, uh, ex pretty much explicitly for that reason. That I think it looks like it may be the first, not to sidetrack this whole conversation into talking about Rogue One, but that it looks like Rogue One may be the first Star Wars movie that has a chance to uh, have a really strong message about something. Whereas all the other Star Wars movies, uh, they all obviously are compelling stories, so there's something that they're about. But they're primarily about telling these really great stories about these characters where Rogue One is going to be this gritty kind of war story. And like you say, I think you're right. I think we're going to see duty come into this and people's morals conflicting with what their duty is. And uh, it just may be a very interesting uh, message that they explore in that movie. So I, I agree. I think that'll be fascinating. Yeah, uh, definitely. And so uh, Rebels has been a great source of inspiration for duty as well. Um, Rebels just keeps a, getting better, doesn't it? That's I've, a great show. I've really enjoyed it, um, and uh, and yeah, it's there's definitely a lot, especially the character of, of Hera is a really great study in that. So you know, I would sort of look to her for for story ideas for that, and it's been Rebels has been great for morality too. Rebel Rebels is actually a wonderful fusion of Edge of the Empire, Age of Rebellion, and Force and Destiny. I agree, and uh, I think it's, I, I agree. I think that's a great show, and I would definitely recommend people check that out if they're looking for ideas. Uh, we're just we're getting close to uh, I think our time before we want to wrap up. So I have a few questions I just want to bounce off of you here uh, mm -hmm. before we go. Um, but thank you for for talking about all that stuff about X Wing and about morality. Those were my big questions that I've had that have been burning. Um, but okay, just a few things that I've wondered. Um, in particular, one thing in in running games I found is uh, so if someone is force sensitive and they want to get a higher force rating. From what I've seen in the rule books, it looks like the only way to do that is through taking additional career specializations and maxing them all the way out, basically to get your next force point. Um, is there is there something that I'm missing, or is that that's basically the only way to to level up as a for or gain more force rating? Uh, that is basically the only way to gain more force rating. There are a few talents that let you circumstantially. Um, Okay. Uh, modify your force rating. I believe knowledge is power, for instance, lets you use um, a skill for it. So there, there are ways to, there are ways to like temporarily boost it. But yeah, in terms of, um, hmm. in terms of the, uh, the. So is, is that a, is that a choice you guys made as designers to prevent? Because realistically, it seems unless you're playing an extremely long campaign or playing with a GM who's very, very generous people aren't going to be maxing out more than one or two special possibly they might max out a second specialization in my experience that hasn't really happened with my players yet so it's hard to imagine a force user who gets more than three force die you know maybe if someone had three force die they would have i don't know the math but it seems like that would be hundreds and hundreds of xp they would have spent on their character at that point that's about right well, that's definitely intentional, partly because of the way a lot of force powers scale. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, to, to step back a bit, this is actually very similar to the original design consideration for why the only way to increase your um, characteristics is through uh, maxing out specialization trees as well, or re reaching dedication. Because mm -hmm. um, right. you can just beeline for dedication, and you can actually save a lot of experience if you do it that way. Um, if you don't bother to fill out the side things, you just you know shoot for the bottom. Um, True, okay, that's a good point. Um, and, and so uh, force rating is similar, and force rating uh, perhaps scales even more aggressively than um, characteristics do, uh, because a lot of times you'll be jumping up in the silhouette of objects you can affect, and object silhouettes actually don't go up in a, in a linear manner, so... Um, right, uh, they're you know, kind of an exponential growth, right? Exactly, and range bands are similar. So if you're increasing the range band from, you know, one to two, that's a sizable increase, or, uh, you know, like... Uh, 
uh, short to medium, that's a sizable increase. But you know, medium to long is even bigger. And right, you've increased uh, you know, your power not by times two, but times four or eight or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. And so a lot of times it'll be spend one or two force points to do that. So to to keep that scaling in check, uh, it, the growth needs to be reasonable. I mean, with that said, if you did. Uh, there are a couple of trees in Force and Destiny that have two Force ratings and no dedication. So if you were really invested in just getting your Force rating up, you could bomb two of those to the bottom and probably have it in like 300 experience at Force rating five. <laughs> yeah, so it would be it would be interesting to see a character built like that in context of a party with other people who've spent their non-Force users who have spent an equivalent amount of points and see kind of what the balance is, I think. Well, I, I think the Force user would be very good at doing one thing, Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, because they also have to spend experience maxing out their force powers um, to even make that force rating useful, um, and various talents can help that as well. Right. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think you they'd be they would be very very good at something specific. Um, yes. They wouldn't be that great at most things. Um, yeah, so, so it, it does seem like Force users are kind of, uh, they're really powerful at the beginning, but then is, well, no, no, I'm not going to say that. Force users can be as powerful as anybody else, obviously. I just, um, I guess what it makes me think about is putting NPCs in who are powerful in the Force. And it mm. seems like, um, I know, I think, I believe some of the nemesises who have, I'm trying to think to my nemesises in uh, Force and Destiny, but I think there's some guys who have like a three or four Force rating and uh, I might be wrong about that. It seems like you kind of get that a, a PC can never really quite get as powerful as maybe some of the, the force using nemesis uh, that he might be up against. Which, personally, as the DM or the GM, I have no problem with. That's fine by me because I think that is good to have big, powerful baddies that you're fighting against. Um, but I also kind of get the sense of frustration sometimes from players who want to advance quickly, and that's it's a hard thing to advance in. Um, yeah. But, I mean, the force. The force is meant to be difficult, and part of the part of the balancing act. You know, we wanted to make sure that force users and non-force users played well together, and we wanted to make sure that force users felt impressive. But we were also rooting this in the original trilogy, and one of the things about the original trilogy that's important to keep in mind is that the feats that force users perform in the original trilogy are actually not nearly so. Um, uh, uh, there, the 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 prequel trilogy added a lot of things that people think about as being very, you mm -hmm. know, like standout uses of the Force, and they are. But uh, if you look at, you know, Vader and Obi Wan and Palpatine and Luke, yeah. their their uses of the Force are actually pretty limited in the original trilogy. Um, and although they are very impactful, they're not these huge, you know, like acrobatic displays or or crazy abilities. Save Palpatine shooting Force lightning, and he's probably. You know, he and Yoda are the most powerful Force users we see, and they don't do much else but use the Force. Yeah, that's a really um, good point. Yeah. So, so it's, it sticks very true to the original movies in the current uh, it's, system. It's very targeted. And The Force Awakens was very much in that vein as well. I mean, if you look at the lightsaber duel, you know, uh, in The Force Awakens, um, it is much more subdued than the ones in, in the prequel trilogy or Clone Wars. And so I, the, I personally appreciate it, but... Uh, I did as well. Um, uh, I, I enjoy um, big, crazy fight scenes, but I, I, I liked that they very much matched tone with the original trilogy and um, yes. and that. And, um, and Rebels and Clone Wars are actually, uh, although they can get pretty crazy at times, I, I actually think Rebels and Clone Wars are pretty well modeled by mm. uh, the system as well. Um, so anyway, so there are some big, um, there are some big impressive things, you know, that people do with the Force, but... Um, but at the end of the day, a character like Han Solo is still pretty effective, yeah. even surrounded by people who are, you know, not even debatably much more powerful than he is, because, I agree. you know, he, he can talk people into things, and like, yeah, Obi-Wan can mind trick people, and Han can talk somebody into something, and like, although those are different mechanically, and they should be in our game, because the Force is important, they're, at the end of the day, they both got somebody to do something for them, right? Right. So, there's sort of one. these... There's, there's sort of these interesting things, and we've really used, been able to use signature abilities for that, too. Speaking of movie moments, one of my favorite things in the in the system are signature abilities, and mm -hmm. one of the great things about signature abilities is they are sort of these, these metagame moments where you say, okay, I'm gonna, my hired gun is going to 
It's going to do last one standing and take out a bunch of minions. And so you have this you have this big moment where, you know, it's 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 a very you know, it's very narrativist moment where you're like, all right, you know, like we're not going to worry about playing out this combat encounter now because you're just going to end it with this ability. And that's um, I think that's where the game really shines. Is in, we we can get it's easy to get I think bogged down in the dice. Uh, you know, my character sheet has this ability and this ability, and the dice say this. But then there's the narrative aspect of it, which which really brings the game to life, like we were talking about. Which is like, yeah, don't don't get bogged down in that. What would what would be happening in a movie that would make this exciting? Yeah, definitely. And so I think because we've been able to use signature abilities to give um, to give non force users sort of big splashy abilities where they're not maybe they're not doing something that's crazy. They're doing but they're doing something that's really impressive. You know, the diplomat. The yeah. diplomat isn't doing anything supernatural when they're, you know, like yell, yelling at people to prevent a <laughs> combat encounter from happening. But they're doing something really impressive. Yeah. But it's something impressive that a normal human being can do, and people have done all the time. But it's still, in the terms of the narrative, it's as powerful as, you know, like lifting an X-wing out of a swamp or something. In terms of its effectiveness, even though one is supernatural and the other is, you know, clearly mundane. Um, so uh, can I uh, ask you just? Okay, I actually I'm not sure you can comment on this, and please tell me if you can. I don't overstep my bounds. Will we be seeing uh, more core rule books coming out in the future, or have we seen the three core rule books? Uh, I cannot comment on that, unfortunately. Okay, that's fine. I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah, no worries. Any of that. I uh, I don't blame you for asking. I just can't say anything about it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, great. Um, I've got some more questions I'd love to ask, but I do think we should probably. Uh, wrap it up here for this evening. I, I appreciate it so much. This is really great. Um, I would love to uh, follow up this maybe with some other people. Some other interviews down the line would be really fun for us. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Are there any, uh, just a couple of final questions. Are there any, I think you said you don't stream. Are, are there any podcasts or streams or uh, other RPGs that you have a, a passion for that you like to check out? Um. So uh, I, I don't really uh, watch much in the way of um, streams or anything like that. Um, uh, though I did, um, in the vein of RPG streaming, I did see an episode of uh, Harmon Quest the other day that I thought was pretty entertaining. <laughs> yeah, Harmon Quest is pretty entertaining. I, I, I haven't. I've only seen the one episode, and it was just at a at a friend's house. But I thought it was very funny. Uh, I was I, I enjoyed it, and it captured the the right like simultaneous earnest enthusiasm and also like terribleness that generally <laughs> comes up in rpgs that's true yeah I, um, I think that's great stuff man um in terms of role-playing games um yeah uh so i'm uh i'm playing uh end of the world soon one of our other role-playing games i'm uh yeah a friend of mine it's uh in addition to running that a fun game mm -hmm. I, I love the artwork in that game the the books are gorgeous yeah yeah, um, they're really nice. Um, uh, a, uh, a friend of mine is going to be running his first campaign with that. He he's promised cool. to kill us all in two sessions. So uh, his heart's in the right uh, place. And even implied that he might mean in the game. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, uh, there's a ongoing uh, Legend of the Five Rings game I play in. That's a lot of fun. Um, cool. I just ended a Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition game. Um, I don't know, uh, Fiasco, Dread, there are all sorts of great games I play, and I would play more of them if I had more time. Oh, man, I feel that, absolutely. It's one of the best parts about doing a stream, is that uh, I get to like, know that I'm going to play at least this many times in a month, and I have people who feel obligated like they have to come. <laughs> yeah. It's really nice. I've, I've, does, got, now, does it make scheduling any easier? It, it does make it a little bit easier. People try a little bit harder to get there if they know that they're going to be letting down fans. As opposed to like, ah, oh, I can't make it this week to the table or whatever. So, as a, as a, I should try that. It's a, it's a. See if that'll get my players to the table. For no, if for no other reason, I will. I, I, that's I'll keep streaming just to sucker people into play with me. Um, well, there you go. That's <laughs> really you hit on something good. <laughs> it is pretty good. All right, final question before we go. Uh, if you had to choose between a lightsaber or a Boba Fett style uh, jetpack in real life, which one would you go with? Oof, well, I'd kill myself with either of those. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Which would though with that said, I guess, I guess I would choose the lightsaber, because we never see anybody 
accidentally kill himself with a lightsaber, but we do see Boba Fett accidentally kill him, kind of accidentally kill himself with his jetpack, so yeah. I, I guess the lightsaber, I mean, also, I feel like the lightsaber would be really, really useful. Like, one of the challenges of Force and Destiny, of course, as a, as a GM, is, like, you can't put any door in front of your players, because you know it's just coming down ten seconds later. Yeah, yeah, so, like, give them a door to cut through every now and then for fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But, like, when you do that, you're just like, all right, you know. And then, of course, when you actually do that, they spend, like, 20 minutes figuring out a way to go around, and you're like, I just wanted you to lightsaber the stupid door. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think I think I'd have to go with, I'd have to go with lightsaber. I mean, you know, a magic space sword, that's obviously can't, the choice. Can't beat it. I, I think I'd probably choose the same thing. Well, Max, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, for those of you listening to this, uh, you can catch our live play game, Never Tell Me the Odds, uh, every other Friday on our streaming channel, that's Saving Throw Show, uh, twitch.tv slash Saving Throw Show. It's the direct link. We start at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 11. Join in. Your uh, donations influence the outcome of the game, and we'd love to see you there. Uh, thanks so much again, Max. This was great, and keep up the good work. You guys are doing a good job. Thanks so much, and thanks for having me on. <laughs>